Hello, and welcome to the Media Copilot. It's a podcast and newsletter about how generative AI is changing the media, journalism, and the news. I'm Pete Paschal, longtime tech journalist and founder of the Media Copilot. And on this podcast, I'm excited to bring you fascinating conversations with fellow journalists, media executives, and the people helping to build the AI driven newsrooms of the future. I'm excited today to welcome to the Media Copilot podcast, Louise Story. Louise has, been, has had a long career as both a journalist and a news product innovator. At the New York Times, she was an investigative reporter and co wrote the Times Innovation Report. And at the Wall Street Journal, she served as chief product officer and a chief technology officer, overseeing all content strategy, including how the paper approached AI. She currently works as a media consultant, helping newsrooms adapt to digital and AI to increase growth, something the entire industry is in dire need of these days. I'm really excited to talk to Louise about what the rise of generative AI means for media, how journalists can use it in their work, and yes, that lawsuit. Louise, welcome to the Media Copilot. Hi, I'm glad to be here. So let's get right into it. I mean, big news in the last few weeks, the New York Times is suing OpenAI for copyright infringement. Uh, just in the last day or, or so, OpenAI has uh, responded via blog post. Um, tell me your, your thoughts on this. Did you, did you expect this? Did you think it was, was going to come to this? You know, last summer, I actually did talk with a few people about the the fact that I thought there might be some suits here with some of these companies. So I had some friends texting me uh, in December when this happened saying, you called it, you were right. Um, but, you know, the thing is that um, there's no obligation of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or any company, the Associated Press, to do a deal with open AI, right? Mm. There, you know. And um, news and media companies have an obligation to, to look out for the stewardship of public discourse and, in fact, are protected, you know, First Amendment protections uh, to look out for public discourse. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of people with good intentions looking at the situation and saying, what, what do we do here? And um, so... Every media executive today is looking at these terms that OpenAI has been taking around. They've been taking them to all the different media companies and saying, should we do this? Should we not? How does this affect both our public trust obligation, our public discourse obligation, but also our financial reality and our financial trajectory? And um, there's not an easy answer. A lot of media companies are also looking back at what happened with social media and Google and kind of questioning did they get the right cut of the pie for themselves? Did they approach innovation in that space the right way or not? So this is a complicated picture. And it's also a complicated picture with kind of like um, entities that are in some senses, in some places, a little worn out from like a lot of battles in the last 15 years over, you know, their future and digital. And um, so I don't think it's surprising. I think it's really good people in our industry are being thoughtful and at its heart, the, the Times and OpenAI are at different places. It's hard to know if they will ever reach a deal or not. And I just don't think that they're obligated to reach a deal. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Um, it seems that if you're if you are a media executive and thinking about you know your you know content and where trends in tech are going, you know certainly the quote unquote search generative experience is pretty nascent right now. Um, but it's sort of happening at a time when things like referral traffic are dropping off from, from social and even, even search for most, uh, for most companies I think has been, is, is dropping off. We certainly saw that at Coindesk when I was there. Um, but you must be thinking, okay, like, what do I do now? Do I think, do I, do I also sue? Do I wait this out? Do I cut a deal in the same way like Axel Springer just cut a deal with with um, OpenAI? Like, how do you how would you without sort of picking one of those? Like, how how do you think through that decision now? Well, you have to think of the OpenAI opportunity that they're offering to media companies in a few different buckets. So, first of all, OpenAI is not necessarily offering traffic explicitly to right. media companies. You know, the deals with Facebook um, 
and with Google. And those were all things to drive that ultimately had the possibility. And often they did drive traffic to publishers' platforms. Whether or not you're involved in OpenAI's models and their ecosystem, that's not, you know, directly a traffic driving opportunity. What Mm -hmm. it is potentially is a revenue opportunity, right? And um, media companies like revenue and, you know, um, Hmm. are short on revenue in many places. So I think OpenAI, what it has in common with Google and Facebook and the, the, the other deals is there's revenue, there's being involved with the new technology, but what it does not have in common is it's not necessarily about, um, you know, traffic and, and uh, on the internet. And, and that's a big difference. Mm-hmm. That makes it a little bit different strategic discussion. The other thing I think a lot of people are kind of forgetting is a choice not to do a deal with open AI is not a choice not to do AI, right? Like open mm-hmm. AI is not all of AI. Mm-hmm. And I think that all media companies need to have an AI strategy, but I don't think that all companies have to do a deal with OpenAI. OpenAI is a player involved in a massive technological shift. And so I think, you know, if you're a media executive, you've got to like think, you've got to think on a spectrum about how open and how proprietary do you want to be about your data? Your data is both not only data around your audiences, it's also your content is data that can be fed into right. models. So how open do you want to do be and how proprietary do you want to be? If you want to be more open and do a deal with OpenAI or another player, OpenAI is not the only player out there that would like to do deals with media companies. So if you want to do a deal with a player in the AI space and share your data about your stories and potentially your audiences, um, that's fine. You can do that. If you don't want to do that, though, and you say, no, we want to keep it closed. We want to control this. I do think then the burden on a media company that says we don't want to do a deal, the burden on them to to have their own AI technology and their own AI specialist and their own AI plan is higher. Mm-hmm. You know, what I think media companies should not do is say, we're not doing anything around AI at all. We're not looking at it. We're not Um, But I highly doubt that's the case with the New York Times. New York Times has invested heavily in technology um, dating back over a decade. And so I wouldn't read their lawsuit to mean that they want nothing to do with AI. In fact, you Mm -hmm. probably saw they recently hired someone to be an AI editor in in the newsroom. So I did. Zach Seward. Yeah. 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 Yeah, So that that's that's um, that's a good way to think about it. And. Uh, I I kind of wonder, like you know, there's there's obviously a similar calculus went through you know folks at Axel Springer, and you know we're not we're not privy to that. Though I, I'm always a little um, when I hear about these deals with Axel Springer and AP, and sort of okay, you can ingest our content, and then possibly even sort of serve up answers with links. Which again, to your point, I don't think that's the point. I don't think this is going to be a traffic driver for anyone, but. Um, one of the things that feel, it feels a little like there's a certain permanence to it, right? Cause once, once a model is trained on content, it's not like it can just sort of forget it. So it's, you know, um, is there, is there any such thing as like a, a deal you, you can do that isn't in like perpetuity in these cases? I don't know. It's such a new, um, technology. I feel like it's a, it's you're you're kind of almost making like a permanent decision there if you well, if you decide to. Well, certainly you're right on the old content, but certainly if you ended a deal, the new ongoing yeah content wouldn't come in. And actually, when you look at um, when you back test some of these models and look at what they put out, they're not very good um, at answering questions about things that just happened, you know. And that's mm. a real advantage for the news industry is that we have people, human beings who can be on the scene in person or even by, you know, um, listening on a call and ingesting and understanding new things. And um, when you when you compare what the results that come out with these models about very new things, they're not that great. And so um, I don't think it's a deal forever if a media company enters into it, because the reality is that new stuff will happen across our planet every single minute. And if a media company exits um, the, the new content 
wouldn't mm-hmm. go in. So some people have proposed collective action here so that like, you know, let's, let's all get together, not necessarily a class action like lawsuit, but like a, like some kind of alliance that sort of negotiates a larger deal of the news industry, so to speak with, with these platforms. Do you think that's kind of a pipe dream? Do you, or do you think that is something that, um, is even realistic? Uh, and what, what would that even look like? You know, the news industry is not a very collaborative industry. You haven't seen with the other tech players that have come in, you haven't really seen alliances in the news industry to do that. Of course, you'd have to be concerned about antitrust concerns as well. Um, if you really did that and, Mm -hmm. um, it's just not the nature of the news industry. The news industry is very competitive. I mean, just think like at the root of a lot of journalism is getting that story first and, and beating your competitor. And um, so I just right. don't think it's very likely to happen. Cool. Okay. Well, switching topics a bit, um, but still keeping it timely. So we all uh, talk, we all heard about the sports illustrated uh, quote unquote scandal about how these, articles, which I should caveat that they claim, or at least the third party that provided the articles claims were not Gen AI, but everyone kind of knows they were. Um, and, but I, I, I use this as a bit of a proxy for a use case that we've seen time and again in at various publications where they're essentially publishing generative content, uh, presumably without a lot of, uh, checks and balances in that process. Um, first of all, I guess I would say, like, do you think because Sports Illustrated had had this sort of third party provider and sort of revealed sort of a larger sort of ecosystem concern here, is it different from the other cases, which just seemed a little bit more like carelessness or, um, what are your thoughts sort of both about the specific case and the idea, the broad use case of like, okay, we have generative content, uh, and we're publishing it. Okay. So um, on, on the broad idea, you know, I think there's things to be doing with AI and content creation. You know, when I was a top editor at the journal, as well as the chief product technology officer, we did some interesting things with AI. For example, um, we had, we used an early version of um, AI to allow people to upload their photos. And then um, it was a GANS model, which you wouldn't really use this model now, but um, then it would draw them in that Wall Street Journal, you know, speckled, dotted, head cut style. Um, And and that's an example where I think when you think about how AI can help tailor or personalize things to um, a reader or to a viewer, um, that's really powerful because you know, the media has long been a kind of one size fits all. You print a newspaper, you put out a TV broadcast, but the internet and increasingly digital consumer products are tailored to people and the, and news content hasn't really become that. So I think there's some opportunity hmm. there, uh, you know, um, on the margin to do that. The example you gave was more around um, replacing humans in the story you write for everyone. And I don't personally think, um, I'm sure, and I know of some ways, you know, and there are ways that AI can save people time and certainly reduce human workload and make people faster. But I don't really think AI should, should replace or will replace the core of what journalists do. Mm -hmm. I think the best way um, consumer product companies and news organizations can use AI is to think about how can we use it to make new features that are ideally highly engaging with our audiences so they come back more. But how can we use it to do things we're not doing already? Because, you know, at the same time that we're all talking about AI, there is an issue in the news industry, which is that it's pretty low engagement on a lot of media companies, websites, and apps. And so mm-hmm. we need to find other ways to make features, tools, personalized content that will help engage and retain people and bring them back to our site. So I think, you know, pointing AI at how to do that is the way to go. Yeah, there was a sort of an uh, I don't know if it's an old I don't know if it's an adage or anything in media, but something people notice is that, you know, people just don't scroll. Like there's a lot of 
clicky and there's a lot of reading of headlines and leads, presumably. But then do they really get to the bottom of the article? Not very, very few. Um, That said, the whole article is important. And if there are ways to sort of uh, get people sort of to do that, um, maybe AI can help there. And it seems like you're you're alluding to a little bit like I I don't think it's entirely theoretical because I think we're seeing the first steps of the kind of experiences you're talking about with uh, like the app artifact is a, is a good example of like, they're doing these generative summaries of articles and they'll also like read it to you in a celebrity voice. This feels like the first baby steps in kind of a new news experience, but it also seems like there's sort of concerns about like, well, is this story that I see the same as the one that you see? And then does what is, what does that even mean? uh for for the broad consumption of of information right um well, I, I don't know that, you know it needs to be very transparent um mm-hmm. like you know for example one thing we did at the journal which is a very um engaging high performing um piece of journalism that our our audience has loved was um and they still do is the college rankings and we used this is before um you know, generative AI, you can use unstructured data, but we used structured data about the, the scores that every college got. And a visitor to the page could put in what their top couple colleges were and click. And now they got the story that compared and it was relevant to their two colleges. But mm. it was really transparent because you're putting in at the top what your top two colleges are. So you know you're getting a story about those two colleges for you. And so I think you need transparency when you're doing different things for different people. Um, But it will be more engaging in general when it's tailored um, to what people are most interested in. And if you can get them to tell you that. And the news industry has actually struggled to get people to tell them much about it. You know, what you talk about in business and technology is first party data. The news industry has some at different places, but has a lot less um, sharing of information than other types of consumer products. And I think that's because the news industry hasn't actually offered much of a vision or many product features that make it worthwhile to visitors to answer a question about themselves. But if they had something they wanted to do um, Mm -hmm. and they needed to give that information, they would give it in the service of that feature. And so kind of thinking that way, how do we offer a service, offer tools, content features that people see value in and is, is really the way we should go. Yeah. I feel like this is kind of an area where sort of the business side of media has sort of almost further ahead in a sense of like, you know, tailoring um, sort of the, the ad experience or, mm-hmm. or sort of the programmatic experience, so to speak, to say things like location and, you know, whatever your cookie history is, I guess, at least up until the last couple of weeks. Um, but uh, that on the content side that, that you know, we're is not only now just sort of starting to catch up to this idea is like, oh, we can we can tailor things to, to the individual user. Uh, and I could definitely envision a sort of opt-in you know, that's like, hey, you know, the window pops up. We, we're we doing some stuff with our news and we want to make it more relevant to you and your location, et cetera. Do you want to do this? Um, but I also feel like we're, we're getting into sort of almost like advanced level AI stuff where uh, I'm actually curious what you would think. What is the lowest hanging fruit for a newsroom or an organization that's like, okay, we're into generative AI. This clearly we can get some efficiencies out of it. Like what are like the first things you should consider if you're uh, a news organization thinking about applying gen AI to your operation? Well, I mean, low hanging fruit in many places do this in pockets, but a lot of times it's not systematized. I mean, low hanging fruit and some of this is more basic AI, some of generative AI is, you know, automatic transcription of interviews, you know, to make notes that you can synthesize quickly and review. Um, Also things around um, alert systems. We built an alert system at the journal, which um, was very powerful. Essentially um, we looked at stock movements and built a system integrated with Slack where it would Slack the beat relevant beat reporter. If something was happening unusual in one of their companies. So they, they knew like, Mm -hmm. okay, call this company. And that has led to many stories running there faster. They called up, they say, Hey, what's going on to a source. They got the story. Um, so that's something that, um, you can develop. So I think 
assistive reporter tools um, that allow people to go through information faster, but in a very, of course, tested and responsible way. Um, yeah, it seems also like the safest part, right? This is yeah. sort of the news gathering side where it's you're sort of in this raw material uh, phase of, of journalism. Right. I mean, you don't want to you know misinterpret something in the news gathering side. And I think this is where, you know, the human mind is going to remain the most powerful, asking the right questions. What you do as a journalist is to go and ask the questions to get new insights, new information. But I do think there are assistive, assistive technologies um, that can really speed things up. And what, right now, what I see in most of the newsrooms I work with is that individual reporters are using some of the different tools out there. But I don't see actually that many places that are doing newsroom-wide licenses of those and trainings and policies around how to use them. And I think those are table stakes and um, mm-hmm. would be things to look at. And they would save time. They would save money. And they should le- they should lead to better better content. Yeah, it seems to me that it's sort of a generative AI policy of some kind is a, a necessary first step for uh, even tiptoeing into this. Um, so as as more and more newsrooms start to do that, as a, so I think I saw a recent poll that said that the, at least the majority now um, are at least considering it, and something like a decent percentage have them. Um, what what are the first principles that they should sort of steep these principles in? Like, what are what are your top three? Okay, so transparency is a mm-hmm. key one, um, and transparency not only to the uh, to the audience, but also um, really strong, deep understanding in house of what it is you're doing. And this means for most places, hiring more people with technical skills to understand how a model actually works, what what they're actually using. Because again, you can have very well-intentioned people who go down a path and it turns out, you know, maybe something they're using is producing biased results. And it's really important that we're being very thoughtful about the models, the inputs, and you need people who look at that uh, very carefully. So transparency inside, outside, um, yeah, second principle, I'll piggyback on that would be expertise. Um, not only do um, we need to continue diversifying news companies with you know, technical skills and newsrooms with technical skills, but also um, it's a core part of what all media company leaders should learn about. So all media companies should be developed, media company leaders should be developing more technical expertise. Um, that's how they can decide what they invest money in and what, what they do in these things. So I would say transparency, expertise, and then I would say open-mindedness. You know, um, mm. there have been things throughout the entire news industry's history in this country that have been new technologies um, that have worked out. You know, I mean, at one juncture radio <laughs> was something that publishers were very concerned about, right? And I think keeping open-minded and, you know, open-minded about these things, knowing that you can stick to the mission of what you do as a journalist, but also try new things is important. And I think, you know, if people could just remember that what we do as journalists is serve the public. And um, what we're trying to do is uncover new information, bear eyewitness, add context, listen to communities, um, and serve them, that's often done through content. But that's not the same thing as producing content. I don't think of myself as a journalist or as the teams I lead as simply production people, putting stuff Mm -hmm. out. I think of us as people providing a service um, within communities. And And if you focus on that, I think you can grow a little bit more agnostic to the hows on how we do everything and focus more on the mission of serving the public. So I'd like to ask a little bit more about the open-mindedness part, just because I feel like in, in sort of the reality on the ground that I hear from just folks in the industry, that there's still a lot of sort of skepticism about AI. And it's probably brought on by some of these, you know, high profile cases like Sports Illustrated and whatever else where, you know, various operations have had their hand in the generative cookie jar, so to speak. But I also feel like it's it's given a bit of a stigma, you know, and maybe it's also part of this existential fear of like, oh, the industry's in a downturn, you know, there's been a lot of layoffs and and now here comes AI to, to screw things up even more. Uh, how, how do we get past this if, if you're an, an organization that, you know, wants to sort of reap the benefits of this technology? You know, I think um, 
an organization that wants to work through the stigma and move forward should be A, learning about it, but B, finding experiments that are not by and large replacing what your journalists do. That is, that's the best way forward to look for new things. First of all, it will help your business to get more engagement from your audiences. Second of all, um, you need journalists to look at this and be involved in how it's used. So instead of looking at, you know, there is a lot of most of the fear is around what can this do to replace people? And I just don't think that should be people's focus or starting point. I think it should really be how can this help us serve our audiences? How can this help us be more relevant to the public? It's not like the news industry has everything per- had everything perfect and then AI came along. Before AI came along, news industry struggling with engagement, struggling with trust, struggling with relevance, business models in flux, and now AI is on the scene. And so I think looking at it with how, what can we use it for that will help these issues we have um, is the way to approach it. Nice. That's a great way to think about it. Um, I'm curious about yourself and your sort of day-to-day life. How, how are you using AI in your work? Well, um, I've just finished writing a book. It's coming out June 4th from HarperCollins on a totally different topic, but a very important topic. It's called 15 Cents on the Dollar, How Americans Made the Black-White Wealth Gap. And so nice. it's an awesome book, very ambitious, and it's taken a lot of my time. I've been doing that while I've been consulting on media and technology strategy and journalism for numerous big news orgs the last couple of years. So anyways, to your question, um, it's hard to pick a book cover. It's mm-hmm. hard, right? And so, you know, there are human beings making the book cover, but I was trying to kind of iterate and figure out what I thought would be a good idea. And I'm not a very good artist. And so I went into Dolly and I put in my thoughts on what this book cover should have and produced a lot of different images. And it gave me some things I could just show as prompts. And Mm. I thought about it because I'm really a terrible artist. I really cannot draw. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I'm a great writer. It's easy for me to write. I can write quickly, but there's other people out there who are great at drawing, but they're bad at writing. And so maybe that's how they feel when they put something in. And so I, it also helped me just think as a person not to be overly judgmental. I'm sure you've been at the playground and heard different people saying like, oh, I used it for this or that. And as a writer, you can say like, oh, what's wrong with you? You can't write it. But once I had this experience where I realized like I can't draw and that helped me draw something and it's not something we're going to use, but it's something that was helpful in an ideation right. stage. And so you know, there's an example and I, you know, find it interesting to try out different, different tools and learn about them. That's really cool. First of all, congrats on the book. Thank um, you. do you know when it's coming out? Do you have a, a yes, date? June 4th, but nice. it'll, people can be pre-ordering it and they should follow me on, uh, wherever LinkedIn and, and I'll keep it up to speed. Everyone up to speed. Yeah, that's a, that's a really cool use case. I was actually thinking as you were talking, when you went into the book, there's something that, um, I've had some some authors ask me about in terms of uh, almost like a, a research assistant when you are writing the book, you know what I mean? And uh, I got to say that that sounds like a really good use case potentially for someone to build a tool, uh, sort of like the author co-pilot or something. Um, might be a little early for that, but uh, I definitely can know there there is a demand for that and probably something you, you would have liked to have had when you were writing it. Um, so... Uh, I would like to sort of end things on uh, pulling out a, a bit of a crystal ball and, and get a little speculative about the future. Uh, so think about how Gen AI is changing things and assuming the hype cycle doesn't crash entirely, which is certainly possible, um, but project out five years. Like how, how do you see AI not just sort of changing sort of what you and I and journalists do but like the information ecosystem, right? Like we, we started this conversation talking about at least touching on the search generative experience. And I think there's uh, maybe an assumption that that's going to take over, not entirely, but it's more and more people are going to go to tools, whether it's OpenAI or Google, and just want the answer. And they'll get better and better at just providing the answer. And then, you know, you think about like, well, what is 
what is the role of a journalist and then a, a media company or, or a newspaper in that ecosystem and how do they adapt to that? And we've touched on a little bit of this, but like, what, where do you see, again, I know it's a big question, but like how, what's, what does being an editor or a journalist look like in, in five years, do you think? Well, we have had a shift going back quite a while now, you know, five, six, seven years where it's become more clear to news organizations that people want questions answered. And actually, when I um, was running live video at the New York Times, um, we would be live in the field from whatever, a market in China or from the border with Texas and Mexico with a border guard. And in every live video segment we did, the reporter, the New York Times reporter who was there, would spend about one third of their time asking the news subject questions from the audience that, that were coming in. And the engagement on that was extraordinarily high. The length of time people would watch, it really made a strong impression on me as a journalist and a media leader that the public wanted not only to see the reporters' questions, but they wanted to see some of their own or some of the other audiences. Um, and it changes the journalism. We had I had a number of reporters tell me their stories were better because of it. So that's gone back a long time. You've seen a lot more news orgs that do features like ask a reporter, ask an editor. We introduce that at the journal. It's something people really like. And if you've seen, for example, the Washington Post, if you scroll on their app um, to the lower section, they have a lot, a whole section on their homepage every day of Q&As that they do with people. And so news orgs are, are doing questions and answers more than they ever did. And that's because user behavior has already been changing with just search engines, right? And so mm. I think that, um, you know, AI will change it even more and people will continue to want the answer. And not only will they want the answer, they're going to want the answer for them. And so that's why I gave you the example of the college rankings of the Wall Street Journal. That was, well, which of these two colleges is better for me? And they don't want to see the whole list of colleges. They want to see the ones they're looking at. And so I think there's a lot of news content and product innovation that news companies can do. I think it's really exciting to try to serve that need and that interest from readers um, for answers. And that'll be a big space of innovation. Nice. It sounds like sort of the takeaway is that the organizations and the journalists who can use whether it's AI or any tool to make that more of a conversation with their readers, more of a two way. And yes. they're a bit of a, um, a facilitator of, you know, their relationship with just the information. Um, then that, those are the ones that will thrive. I think that'll be a big part of journalism. Certainly not all, but it, it will be a bigger piece of journalism. Nice. Louise, this has been great. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thanks for having me. You have been listening to the Media Copilot. Check us out at mediacopilot.ai. You can also follow us on Twitter at the Media Copilot. Be seeing you in the future.